Hi, everyone. I am here today with civil net political analyst and commentator Eric Hagopian. Eric, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure. So with Highbrand, I was always seeking to get a variety of perspectives with all things pertaining to the branding and success of Armenia. And now after the devastating war, it feels more important than ever to have these discussions because all of us who love our country are looking for answers and we're looking for solutions. Um, I watch all of your videos. You always have very interesting insight. And um, with it being such a trying time in Armenia, where do you feel we are today? Uh... Well, I mean, what, you want to be more specific about that. Where are we at as a, in a political moment, in a cultural moment? I mean, uh, like... In a political moment, because there seem to be developments every day. Like, I had all of these questions prepared for you, and then today I woke up and I had, like, 10 more questions because there are so many changes. Well, I, I think we're obviously in a difficult political moment. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's almost like a you know, birth pangs of a new age in, in some ways. Uh, in some ways, this war smashed everything that was old, uh, a lot of our ideas, assumptions, conceptions of who we are, where we need to go, what we need to do, how good we were, how weak we were, how delusional we were, uh, and is actually prompting a lot of re-questioning. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's, this is a serious crisis. So it's an issue of how you respond to it and how you come out of it. Uh, there's obviously a lot of pain and negativity uh, that's tied to this. Most of the pain directly involved people that we've lost or the process of getting them back or our POWs, hostages, however you want to say it. Uh, but I think it's also a moment to reflect and to understand uh, our failures uh, and to learn from them and more importantly, not to play the easy blame game. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it, it's, even though there are people responsible for our failures, uh, clearly there are people who are, uh, you know, you can blame is not equal uh, on our failures and the reasons that we lost and what came of it. But I think above and beyond that, we all need to look at ourselves and question ourselves, things that we've done, things that we haven't done. You start from there and after you question yourself and where you come from and the things that you didn't do or the failures we've had collectively, then you can turn around and say, well, you know, this person did this and this person didn't do that. But I think the key, the key moment here is uh, how do we learn from this and how do we come out of it? Uh, because we will come out of it. And as difficult as these past three or four months have been in the post-war period, you know, we haven't had a military coup. We were not led by a dictator. People aren't killing each other, uh, despite what people think in the diaspora life is actually quite normal here on a daily basis. Unhappily uh, normal, but, you know, life goes on and kids go to school, people go to work. Uh, that's not the impression that people get living in uh, the diaspora for the most part because of the media out there. Uh, but it's a difficult process, but it's, it's a time that we challenge ourselves and we change or we grow or we go back to the same failures of the past. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the media because people have different pers perceptions of the media right now. There are people who perceive that there's some people are really alarmist with what's happening, but other people feel that certain media outlets, especially foreign funded ones, are creating a sense of a false sense of calm when there are urgent matters that need to be taken care of or immediate changes that need to be made. So mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, uh, a false sense of calm, I mean, and, and you know, this, things are generally calm here. This is not, uh, you know, these are not anywhere near, you know, the sort of the revolutionary moments we had in April of 2018. It's just not like that. I mean, it's, uh, on any demonstration that you see, it's two, 3,000 people. It's frankly more apathy than anything, to be honest. Uh, so it's, it's not like uh, people not showing up on the street as some great uh, uh, level of support for the government. It's just that they just don't think that's, that's what's needed at this point. Uh, or they don't see the alternatives as credible. 
uh, at this point to the current government. Uh, but I can just tell you, I mean, the alarmist side is more concerning than the calming side is because uh, some of the things that I get, some of the correspondences that I get, especially from Southern California are uh, you know, borderline insane as far as what people say or think or That's conspiracies or, I'm not gonna get into the specifics, but I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous amounts of, uh, uh, you know, someone writing me from Burbank, is it true like in 12 hours, the Azeris are gonna attack soon? It's like, uh, yeah. if it's an attack, how do you know in Burbank it's gonna happen? I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, who, who told you that? So there's, there's this absurd level of uh, uh, paranoia. Obviously, the war gives, gives everyone sort of a backdrop to be like that, but uh, we should not be absurdly alarmist. However, we should take the reform job of what we need to do to defend the country really seriously, that those are not contradictory things. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, causing panic or making things up or exaggerating things is not the way to go. Uh, as far as certain you know, sources trying to calm people down, I don't really see that. I see that as more counterweighing uh, the absurd amount of paranoia that's going on by the alarmist media, which uh, for the most part in our media, it's taken far less seriously than it is in the diaspora. Hmm. Well, it's interesting because when you bring up kind of the delusions that we had about our strengths before, I think that was perhaps a result of us believing in our own propaganda that we thought mm -hmm. were the best. We have the strongest army and we really believed in a lot of the strengths that didn't exist. So I think because there was so much that we realized that we actually didn't know, that's perhaps where some of the alarmists are coming from because now it's really hard. The whole process has been so demoralizing and it's really mm -hmm. difficult to understand which sources of information to trust, especially when there are so many contradictions. I mean, how do we filter through the misinformation, through the disinformation? How do we come up with conclusions? Because if we want to find solutions, we have to have some sort of an opinion about something, right? To come to some sort yeah. of conclusion and it's hard. It's really hard to. Well, it, it, it is difficult, and especially asking an average person, an average citizen who is not obsessed with the news in the way probably me and you are, uh, to, to decipher through everything uh, is a really difficult thing. However, I think in this modern age, and this is not simply an Armenian thing or an Armenian-based thing, uh, if you are not an educated user of information, you're going to be doing yourself and your community or your country a lot of damage. So you need to filter through uh, and try to educate yourself. Um, and the, the first thing is to, the first point is to question everyone and everything. And I always tell people that, I can question me, question the sources that I come from, uh, because everyone has an angle. Uh, you know, there's no such thing as unbiased journalism. You know, you, you, come, you come at it from a set of preconceived ideas and notions. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you need to question everyone and everything. Second of all, you know, uh, you hear something, think about it. You know, and I brought this up. One of the rumors in the last couple of weeks has been that they're going to tear down the, the genocide monument and going to replace it with someone's statue. It's like, well, what sense does that make? I mean, who, who benefits from that? So if something that sounds utterly, completely absurd, you should discount it and move on to the next item. So uh, the key thing is to become an educated user of news sources, is to be a skeptical uh, user of news sources. Think, think about everyone critically and question things that you hear and to see what context it makes. For example, this all of this weekend was about, there's gonna be an attack on Sunik. Well, uh, how much sense does that make? They've just won this war. Uh, any attack on Armenia proper is essentially a war with Russia. Do the Azeris need that? Uh, why does, you know, Azeri, why does Aleyev say some of the things he does? mostly for domestic consumption, uh, because at the end of the day, despite their victory, you know, uh, there are multiple armies in what he considers his territory. There are Armenian troops on his territory that he claims as, as his own, which is Artsakh. There's Artsakh troops on his territory. There's Russian troops on his territory and there's Turkish troops on his territory. So he has to say some of these things and we shouldn't fall for all of these provocations. But I think you just need to be a critical uh, user of the news. 
and not be led this way or that way. And I, when what I've noticed is that this, and there's a level <clears throat> of a distinct level of disinformation. It's not just simply misunderstanding. Some of these things are deliberately put out there by certain people and pushed uh, for their purposes. Uh, even if you agree with their purposes, I don't think that's helpful to the process. Uh, if you wanted the government to go, you know what? There's plenty of reasonable and good uh, lines of attack that are not uh, made up. Uh, attack them on their competence, attack them on things Pashinyan said before the war, attack him on his incompetence. I mean, there's, you don't need to make anything up to attack this government, okay? There's plenty of good reasons to attack him without going into ridiculous uh, hyperboles that are, have no basis in reality uh, or, or make no sense. So just to answer your question, look at everything critically and try to educate yourself to the extent that the average person can, given your limitations of time. But if something generally sounds absurd or ridiculous, it's, it's probably not true. And you move on to the next thing. The difference here in Armenia is you have the life experience of Armenia. And, and I'll give you a perfect example about things in the war. Uh, I've, in polling, I think it was like 30% of people said they had some, somebody from their family at the war, which is a very high number. If you do that same poll in the United States, it'll be 1% of people that have any relationship to the wars going on around the world using the US military. So what happens is that if you were making things up about the war, like we should have kept going, you know, why did we, why did we sign the, the ceasefire deal as a horror, you know, all of these things. <clears throat> if you're sitting in Glendale, you can buy into all of that because you, there's no filter. Uh, but when your son, your nephew, your neighbor's son comes home and says, we were losing the war. And if we hadn't signed this thing, we would have been killed or we would have been all surrounded from behind. You know, if they would have made the breakthrough up the rest of Artsakh through Stepanakir, you get a filter. Uh, no one likes the result, but there's a context to it. Uh, so the, the life, the, some of this propaganda stuff, frankly, has not moved anyone in Hayasta is because you see it on a daily basis. You talk to people and there's, there's sort of this life you know, filter. In the diaspora, that filter doesn't exist. So all you're seeing is this alarmist <clears throat> uh, uh, set of uh, news stories, some of it made up, some of it real, uh, or some of it exaggerated. And since you don't have that daily filter of life, it just becomes a lot worse. Uh, and saying this does not mitigate the fact that we actually have serious problems and serious issues that need to be dealt with. But frankly, being hysterical about them does not serve any purpose because you can't fix anything if all you're doing is running around hysterically trying to find scapegoats and villains and you know, easy answers to really hard questions. Or more importantly, uh, not asking questions of yourself of the failures that you have had or we have had collectively. It's easy to do. It's easy to blame one person or that person. Uh, but our, our, our failures are collective and we need, to, we need to understand that. And if you're gonna change things, your approach needs to change. I think um, a lot of the blaming isn't really just to point fingers, but it's just the, the issue of accountability because when we have so many of our loved ones who died in this war that we feel perhaps could have been avoided, mm -hmm. uh, then it's really an issue of accountability that how do we make sure that this doesn't happen again and that we don't lose more loved ones? Um, well, I mean, absolutely right. I mean, you, you, you hit on the, the right word. Accountability is the absolute word. Uh, if you look at the trajectory of <clears throat> changes in Armenia, uh, we have, we went from, uh, what the revolution got rid of was, an, was the environment of uh, uh, where everybody can, you know, you could get away with anything. Uh, it was this impunity. It was this culture of impunity that, had, that existed among the elite or the ownership class or, you know, the oligarchic class. One thing we did through the revolution is we got rid of that culture of impunity. That doesn't exist anymore. Uh, you know, it, you know, there's the, it, it, that, that, you know, you, I remember the high Astan of, you know, some person walking in with 20 bodyguards and making everyone feel uncomfortable and that sort of thugocracy that existed, that, that is gone and the revolution got rid of that. What we did not develop is a culture of responsibility. 
And I think some of the angst that you're talking about is that. Uh, let me give you a perfect example. Look, uh, you know, in, in a normal political system, you lose a war like this. If we had a normal political system, the next morning, the prime minister resigns and he gets replaced by someone in his party. There's no crisis. You know, he goes in the same way, like, let's use uh, the United Kingdom as an example. Uh, you know, David Cameron lost the Brexit vote. The next morning, he resigns. Now, this is obviously far more serious than a Brexit vote, as important as that is in England. Uh, but we don't have a normal political crisis, normal political system. Second thing with the military, you know, not a single person among the army chiefs of staff, these same people that are asking for this government to go and that government to go, like, who are they to ask anybody to go? Have they any of them taken responsibility? Have they, any of them taken responsibility for the fact that we all know that during the war there were no serious lines or, or forms of communication that were secure? Uh, that weren't knocked out the first couple of days of the war uh, or basic logistical issues. Have a single one of them taken responsibility for it? No. Have any of the uh, leaders of the old, the people who ran the country for 25 years from Levant de Petrosian to Serge, have they taken responsibility for not building an army that can fight a 21st century war? Uh, and it's not just a question of resources. It's a question of thinking. You know, the Azeris spent $20 billion on the military armaments over the last 20 years. The most useful of it was the last half a billion dollars, which were drone technology and things like that. Most of the other stuff was wasted or stolen uh, or was blown to kingdom come by our guys. So it's, uh, it's, it's a collective thing. And I think you're absolutely right. It's a, you know, people want accountability while we have a political culture, or maybe we can say we have a culture that doesn't allow for accountability. It's all about pointing your finger at this person and that person, which I'm fine with. You know, people need to be held responsible. But first and foremost, you got to take your own responsibility. Uh, and, and, and it starts with the prime minister. You know, he needs to own his mistakes. Frankly, he's actually done more of it than other people have. He's actually admitted some of these things, but then he immediately comes back after and blames 17 other people. So. I think what you're touching on, which is the magic word, accountability, is, 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 is to create a culture of accountability. Uh, it's not just a single act. Mm -hmm. And part of it is by people demanding it. And, and then the way you demand it is you question everyone. You ask Pashinyan, why the hell don't you take responsibility? Or the army chiefs of staff, you know? You go to that building up in uh, <clears throat> uh, the defense headquarters building on top of the hill, and you know, half the cars there are Mercedes Benzes. And, and these are people who, whose average salary is $1,000 a month or $1,500 a month. Well, how did that come about? You know, it's a basic question. You know, uh, Kocharyan and Serge Sarkisian, you know, drones have been around for a long time. How come you weren't buying them 10 years ago? Uh, why are we buying mishmash? So it, it's, 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 an, it's, it's, it's an overall cultural thing. You've touched on it. And it's something that needs to be built. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and frankly, accountability is something that hardly exists in any political system, to be perfectly frank. You look at the American political system, did anyone, has anyone really taken responsibility for the fiasco that is the whole COVID uh, response? It's been a failure across the board. Systematic, you know, half a million people are dead and they didn't have to be. So this is not that's something that's unique to Armenia, but given the fact that it's our own and the stakes are much higher, it's far more important. I was watching your new video this morning where you discussed the International Republican Institute poll, which found that 42% of Armenians reject both the current and former governments. <laughs> um, and I think that a lot of people attribute um, uh, a lot of just people not going out in the streets and not being active, engaged participants right now um, in society to apathy. But I'm not sure that it's that they're apathetic. I think in a way they're feeling a sense of hopelessness uh, in the situation where, as you put it uh, in your recent video, the choice seems to be between incompetence or corruption. So mm -hmm. if they want neither, then what option to do these 42 percent have? What steps can they take realistically in order to reach our collective goals? I, I think, well, it's not, it's not really up to them. It's up to the political class to 
or political actors to create a third force. And, and the third force uh, is, again, something that is it's competent and not corrupt, which is the two things that, uh, that you, it's the two knocks on the other two factors. Part of the problem, frankly, has been the reason that we have not had this opposition uh, that is focused on competence and not being tied to the old regime is the fact that this uh, street opposition, the 17 party opposition has been so visible despite the fact that they're not going anywhere and they have no popular support. You know, these people are gonna get crushed in the elections uh, no matter who's running and who's not running. They're either gonna get crushed by the prime minister and a competing third party or they're gonna get crushed by the prime minister. So these people being very visible has actually stopped the creation of a sensible opposition uh, that is both reformist and at the same time competent or tries to be competent. Uh, so I think what needs to happen is, and then as some of this is happening, there's a lot of conversations about people getting together and trying to present themselves as such. And I suspect that before the elections, there will be, there will be some group some grouping of people that will manage to fill the space one way or the other. Uh, it could be some of the current, like the Bright Armenia Party, which is the third party in, in, in parliament. You know, if they're smart, they can fill that void because they're reformist and they're not corrupt and they're not tied with the street opposition. Someone's going to fill this void eventually, especially if the elections are later on in the year rather than in two months because it's going to be plenty of time for people to organize and get into the game. Uh, but do I, can I put a name to it right now, who that's going to be? I, I can't say. But is there a desire for this? Oh, absolutely, there's a desire for it. And if you look at the polling <clears throat> demographically, who's looking for this group is younger, more affluent and urban you know, people. It's the sort of, uh, in some ways, the foot soldiers of the revolution, you know, the, the, the IT people, the tourism people, the uh, small business person, uh, you know, people working in banking, people who have good paying jobs in Armenia. Uh, they have nowhere to go right now politically. Uh, the prime minister's base is very rural and working class and they're never gonna leave him. If you look at in the, in the polling, they're very tight with him. And uh, the, 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 what constitutes the sort of the opposition on the street on a good day is 10 or 15% of people which aren't gonna amount to much. So someone's gonna make come up. Someone's gonna come up with this magic formula of creating this this vital center between these two groups, uh, and I think it's it, it'll be the best thing that'll happen. But can I put a name to it right now? No, I can't. I mean, there's a lot of conversations of individuals, but uh, the the other thing is that these people can also come in. They can factionalize to such an extent that they become irrelevant, because you don't need seventeen you know, parties trying to fill this role. You need one or two parties trying to fill this role. So hopefully we'll get that. Going back to the sense of urgency, mm -hmm. um, because the negotiations are ongoing, I, I read a lot of different, um, different comments <clears throat> on this book. I'm just always really curious to know where people are uh, in their thinking. And I see that a lot of the fear is in the fact that negotiations are on, ongoing and what if we don't have the right approach? If we have a defeatist approach right now and we continue to make concessions, is that going to lead to a, an even deeper crisis for Armenia? Well, I mean, listen, I think that there's a lot of, uh, first of all, there really are, I mean, it depends on what you mean by negotiations. There are no negotiations going on as far as the, the traditional OSCE model, which is the sort of the, you know, uh, the model that we've had for the last 25 years, they, they don't really exist at this point. I mean, they're, they're, they're starting to put it together, but for the most part, what, what, what is considered negotiations right now is the implementation of the ceasefire deal, which was signed on the night of November 9th. Those are the negotiations. There's no such thing as the broader negotiations. At this point, hopefully, it'll be in our interest of those negotiations revive, uh, because they're, it's a far, far more favorable group to us than for us to constantly debate or argue or the implementation of this horrible ceasefire deal. So I think we need to be clear about what negotiations we're talking about. But why does uh, there seem to be, sorry, why does there seem to be so much uncertainty uh, around how much land we are losing in the new borders? I mean, I think that's, 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 that's I think is a, 
it's a complicated issue. And I think this is this has nothing to do with really losing land. It's a question of the demarcation of what was there. For 30 years, there has not been, you know, there was back in the day in, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, there were these borders that were drawn in the 1920s and 30s, very uh, in, uh, inexact between different Soviet republics. So that there's technically a border between Azerbaijan and Armenia proper, which have which has become irrelevant for the last 30 years because almost all of those areas were under Armenian control in, in what was considered the liberated occupied territories. So you have to be very careful when you're saying losing territory. If you're talking about the occupied territories, yes, we've definitely lost those. But some of this depends on you know these definitions of these inexact borders. Are we getting the worst of those arguments right now? Yeah, I think we're getting the worst of those arguments because the losing side always gets the worst of those arguments. But we shouldn't exaggerate what those mean. They usually mean a couple of hundred meters here, a couple of hundred meters there, this road that was built over a territory that's actually on their side. So I think you need to be very careful by saying losing territories or what you mean by that. Uh, but are we getting the worst of those you know, are we going to get the worst possible deal at this point? Oh, absolutely. Of however these, these borders are drawn, because they're frankly, compared to today's technology, things that were done in the 20s and 30s, almost everything is up to interpretation. Uh, and in fact, our borders across the board anywhere are ill-defined against with Georgia and Azerbaijan in Tavush. Uh, you know, if you go to Tavush, we have the better end of all of these uh, uh, border demarcations because we won the last war and we kept those places uh, in areas that if you actually demark the border, we'll have to give some of them back if you go back to the old border. So I think you need to be careful about what you mean by losing territories. And I think this is, that, this is something that really drives people crazy because they actually think, you know, we're giving up territories in Sunik, which actually isn't true. What, we, what we've given up is the occupied territories. And I think we're getting the worst of these discussions of what's where by a couple of, you know, couple of hundred meters here, a couple of hundred meters there, or infrastructure that was built on the other side of the border because we never thought we're gonna be giving these areas back. So you have to be precise in your language and what you mean. I think this is what drives people crazy because they don't understand the context of this. There's a lot of talk about opening borders with Turkey. What, mm -hmm. what are the consequences of, of that? That's actually the least likely thing to happen on the short run, to be honest, because first of all, this is the thing that people don't understand. We have never closed our border with Turkey. In 1993, Turkey closed its borders with us. Uh, and every single Armenian government since then has been waiting for them to open it. So this notion that we are opening the border, that's not true. Our, our borders are open. They're the ones who closed the border in 1993 after we took over Karbajar. Uh, now, what these mean economically, it's hard to say. I'm not an economist. Uh, for our purposes, any openings to Turkey make our transportation costs cheaper. Uh, it makes our exports and imports cheaper because the Turkish infrastructure and port and things going through Tripizon are far more superior to the Georgian ones and it and give us multiple options in exporting and importing. So on that, on that front, it's a positive. Uh, on the Turkish goods coming into the country, I don't know how much of a difference that really makes because no matter what anybody tells you, Armenia is full of Turkish goods. You know, any, any shop or bazaar you go to, you know, uh, you go to Petak, you know, a third of the things there are Turkish. So how much of a difference does it make for them to come through the border or not? It's hard to say. Uh, but I don't, first of all, I, I don't, this is up to them to open the border. And I don't see Erdogan seeing any great benefit in opening the border with Armenia with his national base. I don't even see that in the short run. So on the Turkish border issue, I think that's a secondary that's likely to come later. But should we be positive about it? Absolutely. The less isolated the country is, the better. Uh, and again, we never closed the border. They're the ones who closed the border. So it's up to them to open it. Uh, now, what economic impact comes from that? I think you're better off asking an economist exactly what that means. Uh, in some ways, closing the border has sort of uh, 
since the Turkish economy is such a mess, you know, they sort of, uh, and the, for example, the Georgian economy is very much integrated into the Turkish economy. When the, the Turkish economy crashed and the lira crashed, it actually had a big negative effect on Georgia. And we were spared that because they have no impact on our economy. But then again, it also keeps us entirely isolated, which is not a good thing. You know, we want to be able to come and go easily when, when it comes to goods and transportation and people. How would we control uh, who gets to buy land and property in Armenia if the borders were to open? So that uh, Armenia doesn't, so that we don't become another Ajaria because that's. Uh, uh, first of all, you, there's, there's ways to control that. You can just, you know, make citizenship laws on, on who can own land. And you have to become, you know, a citizen to own land. Uh, that's that's not that hard. And second of all, what Turk or Azeri in his right mind is going to buy property in Armenia? Is any Armenian in his right mind going to go proper, buy property in Azerbaijan? <laughs> I mean, it's it's sort of a it's sort of a silly. I mean, I'm saying your your question is not silly, but this notion that people are going to be rushing, yeah. Turks are going to be rushing here to buy property. You know, why would they do that? when the next time there's a war, it can be seized in like three seconds. Uh, you know, a good part of Western Armenia and Eastern Turkey is entirely underdeveloped or, you know, poverty stricken. They're not buying land there. So why would they come and buy land in Armenia? For what purpose? There are parts of Georgia you go to where it basically doesn't even feel like Georgia anymore. You're like in well, Azerbaijan. I think, well, I think that's, that's part of it is because of the Ajaria, it's specifically it's a tourism sector. Uh, because the Turks have a lot of history with the tourism sector. So it was easy for them to come in and buy, you know, beach properties or developments. Uh, and Ajaria has a Muslim population, which was sort of an easier thing to meld into. I, I'm not sure if that really applies to in the case of Armenia, uh, because those kind of opportunities really don't exist to get into a specific business. You're not going to go into the Ararat Valley and build a hotel and anyone's going to come and stay there for a vacation. It doesn't work like that. And I think in the case of the Azeris in the Georgian economy, it has to do with the oil infrastructure and the fact that they have the bigger money to come in and, for example, buy their you know, gas network or buy their gas station systems or things of that nature. It's sort of a big investment. It's not necessarily individual investments. On the Turkish case in Ajaria, it's, it's more of a, a tourism-based push that they have a much better infrastructure in taking advantage of that uh, than the Georgians themselves do. But just, just the, the cultural and the political risks of people like that coming here and buying properties, it's, I think it's, uh, we're, we're far away from that because uh, you would need long periods of peace and open borders for anything, for any serious Turkish investors to look into investing or buying anything in Armenia. Um, about our prisoners of war. I saw recently that Maral Najarian was freed. Um, so did I understand correctly that it was Lebanon that was able to have her released? And what that are- seems to be, That seems to be the case. So uh, what are we doing for our prisoners of war? Where are we uh, okay. getting them home? I don't, I don't think we're doing enough. Uh, and I think, I don't think, uh, uh, listen, this is a difficult issue. Because at the end of the day, uh, there's one bad actor here. And the one bad actor is on the other side. There's no reason for any of these people not to be home. There's, there's no reason to have any POWs. There's no reason to have any, what I call them hostages. Uh, so this is really a political play on the other side. It shows their ill will. It shows that they're not interested in peace. Uh, what we're doing, I mean, it, the problem is outside of just constantly raising this, uh, and, I, and I think the, the fact that we're in this weak moment, you can't cause as much of a stink as you normally would. I think it really belies us on inter internationalizing this issue. Uh, the other day I commented on what these Lithuanian cultural leaders did on one of my shows. And this morning, uh, you know, French intellectuals joined them in calling for this to pressure their government to, you know, to push for the release of these POWs and hostages. I think this is gonna take constant, uh, uh, is to make them visible, to constantly bring them up, and to make Azerbaijan pay a public relations price for it. Beyond that, uh, given the fact that they're sitting prisoners in their jails, in a country which, by the way, is quite happy to jail any 
of its own citizens in the horrible, in the most horrible situations. Uh, there's really not much you can do because there's one bad actor here, and the one bad actor is on the other side. So it's a question of embarrassing them internationally and to force them to live up to their obligations. Uh, but beyond that, and outside of constantly raising these issues, I think this is where we frankly all can all come together because uh, no matter what divisions we have, no matter who hates who, for what reason, who needs to come and who needs to go, I think organizing on this on an international level is what we need to do and to constantly make them visible and to never let them be uh, not on the front page or on the first uh, on the first item on the agenda. But as far as practically is concerned on the governmental side, instead of just constantly raising it, uh, and this is more about bringing enough international pressure from people that because at this point, given the defeat in the war, we are not in a place to really pressure them. The pressure needs to come from other places that they care about. It needs to come from the EU, it needs to come from Russia, it needs to come from the United States, it needs to come from France. Uh, they can say no to us. The ask needs to come from people that they, they have a hard time saying no to. So what can we do? What practical steps can we take toward putting that? I, I, well, I mean, I think it's a question of, you know, for example, you know, uh, you're in the United States, write your senator, write your congressman, uh, organize a visit to them about, well, what is the State Department doing? What is the, what is, I mean, as an American, for example, what is Tony Blinken doing about this? Uh, are we meeting with Senator Padilla? Are we meeting with Senator Feinstein? How do you make the, how do you prioritize this? How do you itemize this, for example, into a bill? Um, how do you use the sanction system, the Manginsky sanction system to say anybody who's involved in keeping Armenian uh, prisoners or POWs will get, you know, this sanction or that sanction placed on them? So it's, it's just question, you know, it's just, you use the tools on the ground. And as an American, as people living in the United States, you actually have a lot of leeway to do this. Because uh, if there's one thing that people fear is U.S. pressure, no matter, you know, however the U.S. has been, uh, it's not the country that it used to be in its influence, influence around the world. But uh, I think it's to, if you're in the United States, it's to use the tools, the federal, you know, the tools that are available to us in a federal political system especially on the federal side, to pressure, to constantly bring them up and to force them to be released. Uh, that's really, it's just, it's just a thousand little acts rather than you know, one magic wand that you can uh, wave. Uh, because you need to make the, them pay a high price for this. And the only way to do that is to bring in pressure from people that they are responsive to. And at this point, they're not responsible to, responsive to quote unquote, the Armenian government or Armenians internationally. It's a question of who else we can bring along for this fight. So Armenia's foreign policy, uh, what do you think we should be prioritizing from here, for, from here on forward? Well, I mean, I think there's the short term and the long term. I think in the short term, what you need to do is to uh, stabilize the current situation right now, because we're in such a weak position internationally, where what you want is you want the current system uh, to work, which is that people in Artsakh are secure, uh, that they can go back to the, the parts of Artsakh that we still control, that they can live there in peace, that the current system holds, uh, while it gives us time to you know, rebuild the country, rebuild the economy, and more importantly, rebuild the army. So I think that the, the first short-term goal is to create no, as much normalcy as safety within the parts of Artsakh that we still control, which is most of it, uh, as much as we can. So that's, that's really the short term goal is to create normalcy where people go back to their lives. And most, most Arzaksis, the ones that were not driven out of Hadrut or Shushi are back at home. Most people have gone back home. Uh, and when you have refugees from Arzakh now, they almost all tend to be from Hadrut or Shushi, the two places that were ethnically cleansed. So uh, it's important for us to create as much normalcy as possible. But I think once you, get past this, this sort of the short term normalcy issue, then you need to go back and look at, you know, why were we so isolated during the war? Uh, because, you know, we've had a, a diplomacy failure across the board for, I would say, almost a decade. I think, I think in the post Bartanos Kanyan era, we have not had any significant level of thinking in our foreign policy. So we had a country and the war started was we were incredibly isolated. So you need to sort of work yourself out of that isolation. And what that means is you start 
you know, working the neighborhood around you, uh, you know, starting with the, uh, you know, uh, better relations with uh, the Gulf countries, for example, which are natural allies of ours. Uh, frankly, better relations with Iran, because for all of those countries, for all of that, all of those, that country's faults, they were one of the few countries that were not against us during this war, and they did nothing to harm us. Unlike the Georgians, for example, that were the, you know, the trafficking points of weapons and terrorists that were killing our guys on a daily basis. Uh, I think uh, when it comes to Russia, I think we need to, given the fact that you know, for better or for worse, we're married to that hegemon. I think we need that better understanding of them and where they come from. And we need to make ourselves, frankly, more useful in an alliance with them uh, to sort of raise our value as a partner. Uh, we also need to look at, a, you know, uh, in some ways, if you look at Armenian foreign policy in the post-independence period, we've always had this conception that, you know, we're Russians will take care of all the big things. You know, we, we need to worry about this or that. And we were sort of like almost like a so Soviet Republic. Well, it doesn't, you know, you're, you're with the big boys now, you know, uh, you need to forge your own way. Um, and let's take Turkey, for example. Erdogan is not gonna be there forever. You know, at some point, the Tur Tur Turkish economy is a mess. He's politically vulnerable. We could get up one morning and he's gone. He could lose the next election. Well, what relationships do we have with the opposition in Turkey? An opposition in Turkey, which is most likely if they come to power to not be as aggressive as he is because they would want to reset with the West. So you just have to constantly think about the neighborhood that you're in and have far better understandings of relationships with all the countries around you. Uh, you know, our most natural allies in the beginning of the war were the Gulf countries, especially the UAE. The UAE was busy fighting, you know, the Turkish army in Libya. Uh, do we appeal to them, you know, with, to come and help us, even if it was, you know, uh, not openly? Uh, you know, it's, you know, they, they went all the way to Libya to fight the Turks. You don't think they would have been able to help us to fight, you know, Erdogan much closer to home? But do we even have those relationships? Do we even think in those terms? So part of it is just to upgrade uh, the whole thinking, the whole uh, hard, the software of our foreign policy establishment and thinking, uh, which is, is, is going to take some time. And, and listen, some of the stuff really comes down to for us doing things that we haven't done in 25 years. We paid the price of not building a state for 25 years. What we need to do now is to build a state. And in a state and a foreign policy side, can think ahead and can think, you know, strategically of uh, what neighborhood you're in and how do you engage this neighborhood and how do you use, you know, how do you use your enemies' enemies to become your friends uh, and not be so isolated. We were entirely isolated during the war. You know, we had pretty much the entirety of the world against us. I don't even care. I mean, the EU not doing anything tells me they're against you. Uh, the only countries that in any way helped us or were not against us were Russia and Iran. And even then, you know, those are questionable. Uh, so we need to think in our terms and we need to raise the hardware, the software of our foreign policy and think far more proactively and creatively about these things. Do you think it's a good idea to change laws to allow diasporans to hold important positions in government? Um, what would be the pros and cons of that? Oh, I think it's definitely a good idea. I think uh, I would put some limitations on it. I think uh, I think you should be able to put diasporans in high cabinet positions or cabinet positions. I don't think there's any question about that. I would be wary of having people, for example, be able to run for prime minister. I think that that should be more restrictive mm -hmm. uh, to people who are from here. Or, you know, you, you don't want someone coming in here six months from living in Russia and becoming prime minister. Uh, however, I think in everything else below that, you need to open up and liberalize things because you need to be able to plug in the best people into the best uh, uh, positions. And historically, some of these laws, uh, these dual citizenship laws, 
are really not targeted at what I call the traditional diaspora. They're not really targeted at, you know, American Armenians that have lived in America for a hundred years. What they're really targeted at are someone who left uh, Armenia in 1992, made a fortune in France and wants to come back and run for something because that person is thoroughly culturally integrated and is far bigger threat politically than someone you know whose families lived in Fresno for 100 years. So we need to be very clear about who, who these laws were targeted at to sort of keep people out because almost any Armenian that goes to Russia and makes a fortune is also a Russian citizen. So if you're, if you're not allowing dual citizens to run, what you're really saying is, you know, we want to be able to take people that would have the actual ability of threatening us, uh, our political base and our political power. So I think, yes, it needs to be far more liberal than it is, especially on the administrative level, uh, cabinet level, sub-cabinet level. There should be no restrictions. It should just be based on ability, period. But I think in, on the highest levels, as far as being leading the country, I think you want to be careful with that. Uh, so I, you, we need to greatly liberalize, but uh, understand there's limitations to that. What would be the mechanism of changing such laws? It's just essentially an act of the, uh, the legislature. I mean, it's just the act of the parliament. Parliament can change these laws. You know, it's... Uh, and then to the fact that they haven't, given the fact that they've talked about it, is, uh, is to the extent that even the current government is tied in with the fears and the paranoia of the previous ones. And uh, the fact that, you know, we have a dysfunctional governmental system that even when they want to do something, it doesn't happen. Uh, and I think there's not enough of a push. There wasn't enough of a push before the war. But the one thing that the war proved is that, you know, uh, it's... Uh, what matters is competence. What matters is competence and excellence. And we better change these laws because there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of talent that's being left off the table because of them. And we can't afford that. By the way, for Armenia, do you think it's better to have a presidential system or a parliamentary system? Well, I mean, listen, it's a, it's a, as, a, as a general rule from a democratic political standpoint, parliamentary systems are better. Uh, because they tend to be tend to be collective leadership in the sense that there's a party and the party wins, party loses. And there's a whole cadre of people that come with that party. It's not in a place like Armenia, individualizing power into one hand is not a given the culture. It's not a good thing. It's better to have a collective setup. The problem is that even though we have a parliamentary system, we don't really have political parties. The political parties in Armenia are tied to individuals. The reason that Nikol Pashinyan was not forced to resign on November 9th is because there's really no such thing as the My Step Party. It is Nikol Pashinyan <laughs> is the party. So for him to resign, the party is resigning. There's no, there's no internal structures in those ways. Everything, politics in Armenia is entirely personalized. Everything is, you know, you're a Levonakhan, you're this, you're a Nikol Akhan. It's, it's, it's not, there's no ideological, there's no left, there's no right. Uh, there's no conservative, there's no socialist. It's, 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 it's all based on personality, which is, which is a very underdeveloped system of politics. So ideally, parliamentary systems are better, especially for a country like Armenia, in which there's always a totalitarian temptation or I'm going to have all the power. Uh, but you need a political party that actually work, that, that, the, that the prime minister has to fear that if I do something wrong, my colleagues can get together and dump me. But he doesn't fear that because his colleagues are there because of him uh, and only because of him. Uh, so they're entirely beholden to him. So part of it is a cultural, is that, you know, we need to, our, our political things to, you know, grow culturally. Uh, and let's not forget, I mean, you know, we have, uh, and pe people give us no credit for this, but in most countries in this region, you lose a war like this, in, in about five days, you're, you're led by a cadre of generals. You know, prime minister is gone, you have a military dictatorship or you have some kind of an authoritarian system. Uh, we, that didn't happen here uh, because people wouldn't put up with it. Uh, we don't do authoritarianism well in Armenia. It doesn't go with the culture. 
it's, you know, Armenia, the Armenian culture politically is sort of like this anarchist collective, you know, everyone has to have their say. Uh, and it's very hard to build an authoritarian system like many of our neighbors. So we don't give ourselves credit for that, but that's huge. Uh, you know, we did not fall for the easy totalitarian temptation. Uh, it's been it's been hard, but we didn't go there. That brings me to your article that I thought was so great called uh, Culture Branding and the Importance of Negative Identities. I really encourage everyone to read it. I think it's fantastic. Um, how do you how do you think the world should see us and what do you think we should contribute to the world? Well, I mean, the world doesn't see us now because we're not relevant to the world. You know, we, what, we, we bring nothing to the world. So uh, very little to the world. Uh, we have these, uh, you know, delusions of how relevant we are. And what the war showed us is that no one cares. And no one cares if we are around, no one cares if we're not around, they're not against us, but we have no great value in the big scheme of things. Uh, so I think uh, on, a, on, a, on a more practical level, it's just, you know, you need to build a competent state and a competent economy. I think that's, that's sort of the, that's a given. That's something that's a given in any country because it, almost every kind of power projection starts with having an economic base that is solid and can help you build a competent state and a competent military. But I think there's also the sort of the PR, you know, the sort of the branding of the country and I think there's the most unique things about this country that actually work is our culture. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, we need to look at our strength and culture is actually a tool, you know, you can use as a tool to, to build the country and to brand the country. And there, there's certain things that are quite unique about Armenia. It's, uh, and, I, and then the, if you're gonna put your finger on it, it's actually freedom, you know? Uh, if you look at the map and, and I'll challenge anyone, you know, you, you can get on the map and draw a straight line with your finger from Armenia to South Korea, straight line. And within, the, within that line, you will not find a single country that enjoys the political freedoms or the general freedoms that we enjoy in this country. And that is a humongous accomplishment. Uh, and I think part of that, and if you look at us regionally, I mean, uh, to the, you know, to the uh, uh, west of us, the country is run by this, you know, uh, neo-fascist like Erdogan, uh, who's ruining his country day to day, economically. Uh, Aleyev is like some, you know, uh, oriental despot out of central casting. That's a country that 25 years from now isn't going to go anywhere. It's just going to become another failed you know, Central Asian state. Uh, and we are an island of, uh, we lost this devastating war and no one got killed, you know, there were beatings, things like that and stupid things that happened the first night of the war, the war ended. But, you know, we're working our way through it, uh, mostly democratically and mostly peacefully as unhappily as that is. And that's quite unique. So part of the thing to understand, and I always tell Europeans this, you know, uh, people think that Armenia became a free country or a democratic country because of, you know, Western pressure. That's actually not true. You know, the West spent billions of dollars to format revolution in Ukraine, they've spent millions, billions of dollars on Georgia. And uh, we became a democracy on our own. Is it an imperfect democracy? Absolutely. Uh, do we have a good legal system that can uphold these uh, or laws or not? Not at all. So it's a developing thing. But I think what we have shown the world is that your geography is not an excuse for tyranny. Uh, a lot of people use this, you know, it's very easy. Oh, we're in a rough neighborhood. You need a tough hand. You need a dictator. No, no, no. You don't need that because that's the road to hell. Uh, that, that, that temptation, you know, where's Stalin that can give all the orders and make all the decisions. And, and really what that really comes down to is I don't want to take responsibility for myself or my country. So let's give it to some despot that can make all the right decisions, despite the fact that history tells us people like that at the end of the day almost make all the wrong decisions. 
so I think what we, the branding of the country is freedom in the context of, uh, we have made this, uh, uh, we're, we, we're a traditional culture, an old world culture in a way that is also uh, an open and free culture. Uh, you know, uh, we've managed to not, you know, to, to uphold our sort of collective way of life. And, you know, the way, you know how life is in Armenia, you know, people are, if you need your neighbors, they'll be there. Uh, you know, uh, you can be modern yet respect your grandparents. We've sort of made this work in a way that uh, we've, we're a free country without necessarily becoming Western, which is quite unique. Not that there's anything wrong with being Western, but that's not who we are. So I think we're sort of branding this specific way of life that is in some way a roadmap for the people in this region. Uh, you know, um, you look at Iran, it's a country full of really educated people if left to their own devices, they can come up with their own formula of freedom like we have. Uh, again, it's an imperfect process. It's an un unhappy process in many ways, but we need to understand how unique we are and sort of brand that. And in some ways, I said, when I talk about negative branding is you sort of compare yourself to your neighbors. Why are we free? Why can I sit here and say the prime minister should resign? And if I did the same thing in Baku, within the first 45 minutes, someone would have knocked on my door to arrest me. You know, while this conversation is going on, they would have arrested me. So we need to compare what we have compared to what other people don't have. Uh, you did this in Turkey, the same result. You did this in Iran, the same result. You did this in Russia, the same result. Why are we different? And we should tell that story. So we define ourselves by what we've created, by this essential cultural strengths that we have that are so much of it is based on individualism, freedom, uh, and uh, respect. Uh, and you compare it to what our neighbors don't have. You know, we're an island of democracy in a sea of tyrannies. One thing that happened during the war was essentially two democracies were attacked by a couple of neo-fascist states, which is very much like, you know, you go back Spain, 1936, when, you know, uh, Franco got together with the Germans and the Italians to destroy the Spanish Republic. This was part of the reason that we were attacked is because we're a bad example. You know, we're a bad example for uh, a lot of leaders in this area. Uh, and despite the fact that we paid the price for being a bad example, we still didn't give up on what we're trying to create here, which is huge. So we need to market that. We need to brand that. We need to own it. And, and the image of the Armenian should not be the refugee. The image of the Armenian should be you know, our tech sector. You know, these, you know, you look at the companies that we have, Crisp, Pixar, even Vivara, which is a gambling thing, but you know, hell, they're on the front of Arsenal at this point, you know? So we have a lot of things going for us and we need to get away from this, you know, victim mentality, you know, the, the, the sort of, meaning, you know, the, the image of the new Armenian has to be this strong stoic figure that, yeah, we're in a lousy neighborhood, but we're not gonna complain about it. We're gonna make this work and we're not gonna become tyrannical like other people have. And, why and we're still going to make things work. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Why is branding and marketing, marketing important? Is it to attract tourism, to attract investment, or for other reasons? Listen, I think almost everything in the world today is a public relations and branding story. And what is branding? Branding is simply telling a story. Almost, listen, almost anything in the world today, as, as, as you probably well know, is, is telling a narrative and telling a story. Whether you're a celebrity, or you're a country, you're a political party, you're a movement. It's all about what story are you telling? It's all storytelling. And what's our story? Have we even thought about what our story is? And you know, when you look at it, we have a darn good story. But, but what's our story? Our story right now is all the things that are horrible or things that have happened to us, uh, which are true, but nobody cares. You know, we have, to, we have to come grips with this fact. Nobody cares that we suffer the genocide. 
They don't. Okay, so how do you how do you brand us in a different way? And how you define us is not the fact that we had a genocide. You define us by the fact that we rose from the ashes when other people were buried by their genocides. It's not to say, this is not to discount what happened to our ancestors whatsoever, but for the purposes of telling our story, it's the resurrection that matters and not the crucifixion. You know, that's what we need to focus on. With all that they tried, we're still here. We're coming up with new ideas. We're living free when the people who oppressed us are slaves. That's a hell of a story. And are we saying that story? Are we saying it in a way that matters to the world? And we just need to think in these terms. Again, I'm not saying this, that, that I have all the answers or my article is some guidebook that we need to follow like it's the Bible or something. That's, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. These are just simply designed for starting a conversation. I'm not, I'm not that smart to give some singular thing that we need to do. It doesn't work like that. These are our collective efforts. It's just a question of making us question our assumptions. And this time period is a time where we question all assumptions. And we need to, like, you know, uh, what do we want the world to think of us? Do we want the world to think of us as these black and white pictures from 1916, as real as they are? Or do we want them to think about us of our colorful pictures from 2021, when we're still around, we're doing creative things and we're living free? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly why it resonated with me because um, in general, the fact that we've always been known for the Armenian genocide, but in the US, when I meet people, they really don't know anything about Armenia besides the genocide. And so we have all of these amazing things about our history, our culture, and we need to really be able to communicate that to the rest of the world. And I think you wrote it really well here, uh, where you said, only resurrections are miracles and we are that miracle because it's coming from a position of strength. And even when the revolution happened, my thought during the revolution, I was in Armenia when the revolution happened and my thought was that it's so great that finally we have a victory in the people where they feel like, you know what, we overcame a huge obstacle and we can build from here. And so that's the part that was really meaningful to me that uh, finally we're not going to feel like victims anymore. And then it went in a different direction. But I really want for Armenians to be coming from that position of strength and from building because there's so much talent in the Armenian people. I think we're a really smart, com competent, um, and caring and wonderful people and we have so much to contribute to the world and now it's just a really good time to discuss and to organize and to understand the practical steps of how to do that um, because I think we have a lot of great individuals who do that but to be able to do that as a community also. Oh absolutely I agree with you 100 percent I agree with you 100 percent. Eric, thank you so much this was such an interesting conversation and I hope we'll get to do it again because um, it's always so great watching your videos and seeing what you have to say about all of the developments. Well, I, I really appreciate that. I'm looking forward to it. I also like the fact that, uh, that uh, you're an Armenian woman doing this because I think we have a lot of, I've done a lot of these interviews and more often than not, it's guys, which they're fine. They're great people. So <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that uh, Armenian women are getting into this. Uh, uh, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know what you call it, blogging, blog posting, uh, and I'm not technically savvy enough to put a name to it, but I'm glad you're there and I would encourage other people to join you. Thank you.